Tanakoto, 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 Kato, No, Maku, Tiara, Aho, Ko, Broxop, Tifano, Ko, Adrian, Aho, Ka, Nui, Ti, Mihi, Ki, Kato, Tanakoto, 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 Kato. So welcome everyone to um, another webinar from the um, Capability Project. Um, so Enzyme, co-funded Enzyme, Regional Councils and MFE funded project. Um, a big welcome to have you all along here today. Um, just before we start, I will um, just open with a karakia. So Maori aho, um, Maori tu, Maori hora, ke at tato, komi hi, Huie Tiaki. -e. So welcome to this. Um, we're very privileged to um, have a presentation today on open and geospatial making um, geospatial um, data work for you. So um, thank you very much for Eagle for coming along to this. We've got a what um, a uh, a large um, um, technical group here, which is really good. So I really encourage you to um, put some questions forward in the Q&A session. So what we'll do, we'll have a presentation and that presentation will be from Jessica and Scott, um, but there is the back um, um, support for those technical questions. So don't hold back. Um, I'm really keen to hear on how we believe Geospatial can move and um, help you as we move into the freshwater farm plan era and how we can, in terms of this project, help you in terms of further the training or other sessions or other webinars um, to do that. So um, please, if you've got any ideas, can you put those into the Q&A as well? So um, I'll just hand, um, I'll hand over in a minute to start the presentation, which will be around 40 to 45 minutes, and then there'll be 15 to 20 minutes of questioning at the end. But if we don't get to all the questions, um, the team's really keen to answer those questions for you because um, this is an, in, an, an important space um, in the farm planning space. So with that, I will hand over to uh, Scott and Jessica. Cool, thank you, Adrian. Good. Um, yeah, thanks to Andrew Arm for allowing us to present today. Um, I'll just do some quick introductions um, on behalf of the team who are uh, presenting and also who join us for the questions and answers later on. So um, my name is Scott Campbell, I'm the head of GMS Technology at um, Technology. There we are. Um, I'm based in uh, Wellington, and I'm also joined here with, uh, by Jess. Hi. So Jess Houston is one of our GM solution engineers. And we also have joining us from uh, remotely from the wider GIS team at Eagle Road called Sarah Fisher Campbell. Who's up in Rotorua, and then Bowdoin, who is based uh, two hours west in the Western Island. So, um, thanks again for letting us come and join you. Today's topics, um, we've got a range of things we wanted to cover, some fundamental pieces of information, those of you who may be new to this topic of technology, as well as some specific um, some technical specifics um, to do with resource management and you know, freshwater farm plans. That are relatively new and maybe new to a lot of you. Um, but it is a range of experience we have in the audience, we understand. So please bear with us if we're covering stuff that you already know, uh, but hopefully it's useful in some regard to everyone. And as Adrian says, we're hoping to have time for QA at the end of the session. So a little bit about Eagle Technology. We're a private New Zealand technology company. And we've got offices in Auckland, Wellington, and um, Christchurch. We really focused on creating solutions that are geospatial in nature, using geospatial technology to solve a range of problems uh, across all sectors, but including the resource management and agriculture and regional council sectors. Um, primarily, we use a technology called Esri Art GIS, and we'll show that a little bit later on. Um, we do use other technologies also, and we also represent a number of uh, technologies that are data sources from above. So uh, more and more, we're getting uh, satellite imagery coming to the fore. And so we work with a couple of providers there to um, bring data in to, to make pretty pictures, but also to use for analysis. We'll look at that also in a little bit. So that's a bit about us. We at Eagle Hope are not, uh, by no means at all, we specialists in agriculture or soil science or environmental science. 
or resource management per se. But we do, we have been working uh, with others in this sector for many years. And our technology currently underpins many of the um, mapping and geospatial capability for, for New Zealand leading organizations in these sectors, including for New Zealand local and uh, regional government, and also in the, the farming sector itself. We've been working, um, also working from a data perspective. Uh, from a data perspective around um, we're from a data perspective around um, the, re the upcoming changes to uh, compliance management, including what the technology we're talking about can support must be. This is GIS or geospatial technology. Um, with GIS being used widely across New Zealand, many of you in this session will already be familiar with this technology, but GIS uh, or a geographic information system um, is what we're talking about there. There are many related terms, such as spatial, geospatial, location technology, geomatics, etc., which cover the science, the analysis, and the data in this area. But essentially, they all relate to using location as a common key to view, to connect, to manage, to understand, and create all of this information. One way of talking about this is having a geographic approach to um, this information, which allows us to bring together data sets, or we call these things layers, representing different aspects of real world information, including those which might be considered either the physical or, or human geography, if you go back to your school geography days. Uh, and these layers that are used depending upon the types of questions that are being asked or the map being created. So you use different layers for different questions or different applications. In the context of today's session, these would include things like farm boundaries, soils, water bodies, land use, infrastructure like irrigation and assets such as sheds or fences and so on. But the list is kind of endless. It really depends on what you want to analyze, what you want to map, and what you want to support. So we'll see how these are brought together um, shortly. One thing to note is when we're talking about GIS and open data and mapping, we're not just talking about 2D traditional maps here. Uh, one of the outputs of GIS often is a paper map that you can take in your hand and take around a, a farm, which is a really still a valid use case. But a lot of these um, outputs are also digital and they might be 2D or 3D with interaction. And they might be um, also be, have some sort of form of analysis or measurement in there. So uh, using the computers to really earn their money, whether it's uh, crunching numbers or doing deep learning or doing measurement tools, that's one of the real values of what we're talking about here is not just creating the map itself, but actually asking questions of the data that is within the map. The last thing I want to cover as means of an introduction to this topic is how GIS is being used and by whom. So it really comes down to the right tool for the job. Um, different environments, different skill levels, different applications, different roles, and different hardware. It's all based upon the particular task in hand. So you might have someone who's mapping a farm using a mobile device with a really simple interface, or you might have someone who's in a sort of GIS professional role in an office doing complex analysis. The data sets that they're using are essentially all the same, and um, even if the tools are a little bit different. But it's a really, um, it's a really enabling technology that can be used by a range of different people across the sector. So open data. Open data is a term that many of you probably be familiar with already. Uh, it can be used in many different contexts, uh, whether it's making a chief executive's expense claims for government available on the data.gov website, or whether it's the geospatial stuff we're talking about here. But typically, it's talking about accessible via public-facing portals. So these are websites where you can go on and search for information and access the, the layers of data that you would be interested in, in looking at. And New Zealand's actually one of the global leaders in this area, the open geospatial, and especially in the geographic or um, GIS space, with a score, um, it was last counted on an independent site of 95, which is really up there. And I think what we see in terms of the open data portals that are out there really, um, really um, supports that. There's a whole variety of topics that are out there that you can access data about that has that location or uh, geographic element to it whether it's agriculture specific or urban or the physiography that underlies um, both of them. There are also national sources. 
such as data.gov, which is a DIA and posted website where you can find all kinds of open data, including some spatial data. There's Land Information New Zealand's open data site. There's NEWA and there's Stats in there. There's a whole variety of sources. And we've indexed a few of these and we'll share a bunch of them at the end um, for you to look at yourselves. But just to make you aware, there's those data sets that I believe have national coverage. And then there are those which are regional or local sources. So um, primarily in this session, we've looked at data sets that are available through the national ones, but complemented really, really strongly with the regional and unitary council data sets. But a lot of the physical environment and compliance information is available um, in an open format. And another thing to bear in mind is that how you access this data can be done in like two key ways. And we'll look at these in a little minute. And um, one of them is to download data from the website. And the same way you download a spreadsheet, you can download this GIS data onto your computer and use it there. But actually, increasingly and probably more sustainably, you can access it via a web service. So you can connect your map in, on your computer to the source of information and get a live view of it, which is really powerful as you can imagine. The demonstrations we're going to be using today, or Jess is going to be doing today, I don't get to do hard work. Um, are based on the technology that we at Eagle know best. So we mentioned that we work closely with Esri and EIS technology. That's the tool set we're going to be using today to showcase um, the examples. Uh, and that's also the tool set that's used by the majority of the open data sites that we're consuming information from. So just the context of what we're showing between RGS and a lot of the things that we're using, uh, things we're using at Google RGS online, just a web browser with the EIS capability. So speaking of examples and demonstrations, I'm going to pass over to Jess now to show us some of the basic workflows in terms of using open data in the GIS tool, in this case, RDS Online, to start a farm map. Awesome. Thank you for that, Scott. I'm going to switch gears here and switch out of our appliance for a moment. Okay. So currently we are looking at an example of one of those really awesome open data sources that Scott had mentioned before. So what we're looking at um, is a regional council. We're looking at Canterbury maps, and this is all the open source data that has been uh, published available for um, anyone to use. And this is not specific to farmers, this is anybody. So that means that we're getting lots of different categories. You'll see, uh, basically different replications of this for most regional councils that all use um, as this sort of service to just kind of organize their public data. And when we go into one of these categories, such as environment, um, a lot of these sites are gonna look very, very similar and that we're going to have a list of all these different data sources and uh, information that we might want for our own app. Like this one of air quality monitoring sites, we have biodiversity projects. We have just all sorts of data that we can search through, and we can use any of these filters just to find the data that we're looking for. Uh, and while that's great, uh, how do we get that into our own map? What we want for our farms? Several different ways. Um, they're all pretty straightforward. You can stay on this map world if I want. Um, and you'll always see a, a map here on the right, and you'll see some information on here. And they have this handy little button that says, I want to use this. This gives you a couple of options. You can click this and immediately open a brand new map. Uh, you can, uh, if you have any development background, there's some tools for you there. Um, or you can just open into our Jason line to get some details about the information. But uh, I'm going to go with the easiest possible way, which is that if I already have my map open. So in this other tab here, I actually have my Arcus Online account. And this is what a basic map viewer looks like. And in this demonstration, I've centered it on uh, this uh, demonstration farm over in Cranberry in Ashburton with a boundary of where it is. And there's nothing really going on in this map yet. Um, I have lots of layers that I'll show as we kind of um, but the important thing that I want to show is how to just simply add a data layer like I just showed. And it's clicking the button add, and we have the ability to uh, do add layer from URL, layer from file, but I want to see what's already available that I can just drag and drop into my map. 
And since that online uh, portal, that open data portal, was using ArcGIS to publish those and host those services, that means that if I were to go to ArcGIS online here, and let's say I search up Prairie Maps, I can now see all those data layers that were posted in my clicking ads is all I have to do to suddenly pull that data layer into my own map. And then I have full access to this layer uh, that I can use uh, for whatever tools that I need to for this visualization or for analysis. So from that, I'm going to switch gears and go back to our presentation, but I will continue showing you what else I've got in this map. Let's presentation mode. Thanks, so, Jess. So it's a basic step, but um, illustrate you can bring open data from a case uh, country map, right, which is and plus the you can bring that into your own map. So um, I think I'm sure many of you joined uh, the previous NZR webinar on freshwater farm plans. And as I said, we are not experts in that topic, but we have been working with a few organizations around looking at the data aspects of that. And so we were keen to look at that specifically as a topic as it obviously is very, uh, so interesting in anyway. So um, the background to freshwater farm plants was all covered uh, last week, but the spatial data um, within those farm plants is the part that we're really interested in. What's the mapping data that goes into it? And also the mapping data that might come out of it. So um, there's a couple of things which are relevant in there, uh, including the, the creation of land units, as well as the activities, and then a spatial context. So we'll come back onto that um, in a little bit shorter. But we've got also um, some links to some documents from MIT to talk about how you would go about trading a, a farm plan um, step by step. And uh, if you are familiar with those, you'll know that there's a lot of great updates of data on mapping. And that's why they want to do So, in terms of establishing that spatial data is a key part of um, freshwater farm plans or previous FAPs, as well as other forms of compliance like spray plans, and um, we now want to look at the next level of open data engagement and interaction and how you bring those extra layers into, uh, into that GS map. Sweet. Okay. So, and we're turning to that map I showed just earlier. So, uh, as I kind of give you a sneak preview, I had a whole bunch of layers in this map. Uh, and to show where these came from, I'm actually going to pop out of uh, this. One second. Let's see. and show you uh, another really awesome service that's been provided uh, by Environmental Canary. Um, and this is our FAP maps portal that they created, uh, which is meant solely for the purpose of helping you guys uh, with these farm and environmental plans and providing as much data as possible um, to really make sure you have all the information that you need. Um, that map that I showed, I did wanna show it briefly before I showed this, just so we remember the extent of where we were, again, in Ashburton. And if I zoomed in on this amazing portal here, again, I had clicked on Ashburton here, I can see all these data sources that have been uh, provided uh, to give information about rivers, uh, freshwater, scents. Uh, we have some things about uh, boars and where they're located. And all of these data sets are available for use as well in a very similar manner than I showed before in just pulling it into your own map. So as we can see, lots and lots of data on this map in this area where my farm I think is, and I can use this tool um, if I would like to create a printable report or to share it um, and kind of move my own data and export it from here. However, if you're in your own map uh, with your own data that you want, we can return to Arcus Online here. And so what I had done earlier is actually load up of those data layers from that FAP portal. 
Uh, so in here, I was really interested uh, in some information about resource consents, which are these checkmark grounds. I see that there's there was some land here uh, soil drainage information that I wanted. So I pulled that. And this is the exact same data layers that were in the FEP portal. I just pulled them over here so that I can start layering, layering them on top of maybe some other data sets that I wanted that not just limited to the FEP portal. Uh, for instance, one of the things uh, as I hand selected the imagery that was available. This is something really amazing that uh, Environmental Canterbury provide and that they actually have some historic imagery in Canterbury, uh, including this one, which is 2004 to 2010. But we also have 1965. So they have a wide range of uh, really impressive imagery that's really available for you. As you can see here, I have all these layers here. I have some nutrients, allocation zones. Um, that's awesome. But I'm not just limited uh, to the FAP portal of all the data that I grabbed. There were some other data sources that we did briefly mention, uh, Scott did earlier, uh, including LINS, land information using LINS. There were data sets that I could use, uh, including uh, some river names if I needed. Um, there are street addresses, primary parcels. Again, this is a really authoritative data source that we can add just by browsing through RTS online. Besides LINS, uh, we also have Ministry for Environment uh, has slope exclusion. So we do have that data set available uh, where we can see low slope lands or medium slope lands uh, for those grazing restrictions. If I open this up here, I have in purple, I believe, with low slope. So that is available as well. Um, and then also down here, there are some ESRI services that are also available for use that we think you guys might be interested in, uh, including terrain uh, slope map. And what this uses is actually uh, LIDAR from uh, the LINS elevation program um, just to create uh, some information about the elevation in this area. And then it's been calculated for slope for you. Um, and so in this example, it's pretty high resolution here that we can actually pick up on. If I pull up my legend here, yep, we can see exactly where it's starting to get quite steep, uh, which makes sense as this farm is right next to quite a hilly area. So that's great with all our uh, open data that's available, but there's also um, some options for when you have different data formats. Maybe it's not online and open. Maybe you need to import some data sets. Um, so some of you may be familiar with a very classic uh, data format in GIS known as a shapefile. Um, FarmIQ is an example of organization that uses this format a lot. Um, and in order to get in again in one place, all your data into one portal, one map, uh, it's also pretty straightforward. And that with this little plus button, if we click add, add layer from file, we now have uh, this drop. And if I go here and I had a found a farm boundary that is the shape file that's just been zipped up. And if I just drag and put that in there, it's going to recognize that that's a shape file. And then I just have a couple of options to add some information, make sure I fill out whatever I need to. And then this will just load, read this, and add it directly into the map, publishing a brand new service. This may take a second. Uh, so it's that service that um, when you are talking about the service, I guess it's just emphasizing that's just a layer of a little layer to spoke about. It's just another layer in this case it's come from the tape file. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then the last method. Uh, so obviously I've now I've opened data, I've uh, imported some data. But what about your own data? So this is about how we're going to capture your uh, real life situation um, and what you're actually seeing, your assets, your information. Uh, that's just uh, individual for you. And so in this example, I've created some data through RGS Online in this section here called My Farm. And if I open this up, you see a lot more detail. And this is information that I created. Uh, including assets of where things were. I have some water droughts uh, here. I have um, some assets. Uh, if I look at my legend here, actually, I can see quite a bit more of these assets and I symbolize them. And this is all customizable. You can change colors, you can change symbols to make a map that really represents your farm well. 
Um, but I'm not just limited to being on my computer and adding this information, um, though I'm welcome to change how it looks uh, as much as I would like and draw on the map. I actually have the ability to get some uh, data in the field with uh, some field operation apps. Uh, so uh, there are apps like Field App, for instance. If I pull up my phone, actually. So this screen right here that we're looking at is just me on my phone right now. Uh, and I am navigating. Uh, obviously, I am in the Wellington office. I'm not in Canterbury. But uh, for this example, we can pretend that I am. And if I'm walking around my field uh, and I need to mark something, uh, I can click this little blue button. And then I've created some templates for myself of uh, some items that I want to draw. Like for here, I can say that there is a shade tree. So I'm going to uh, possibly add some information there. Uh, there's a bunch of forms that you can fill out. So you can add information to these maps, uh, any sort of, uh, it's known as an attribute, but it's basically whatever uh, information that you want to have associated with these points. So for instance, uh, I might want to write something about the scenario. Um, I can set the date of when I put down this point. I can add as much information as like just tied to that simple little point that I'm dropping. But I'm not just limited to points. Uh, if I wanted to, I did create these uh, fence lines here over in purple. We'll jump out of that and we'll add another. I can do an inspection if I want to assess anything in this map. I think in this case, I'm going to draw some lines. And the amazing thing about this is that while, yes, I'm doing it manually and drawing around, um, there's actually the ability to stream as you walk around. So that means that if you're walking in a straight line and you don't want to be pressing buttons over and over again, it can just track your location and create a line as you're walking so that you can walk the perimeter of anything that you need to in order to create that. So with those features created, I'll go ahead and get out of my field maps. Make sure that's saved. And I'm actually going to reload this map a little bit to see if I can see some live updates. Again, the idea of this is that uh, it's, it's pretty near real time when you do field maps for any of these uh, sort of field collection apps. Uh, so as we can see here, that line that created, uh, just a not very useful purple line, uh, but immediately pops up on this map as well as this uh, shade tree that I had dropped over there. Right, so uh, with that, let's get back, zoom out a little bit. Um, and I just wanted to mention that, uh, here we go. Let's look at this as a combination of everything now. So we can see here, this is all of uh, ECANN's data that we have pulled in, and this is the Moulin's data that we have, and it's my data. So the idea is that in this portal, we have everything all at once, um, and there are going to be some options for you that if you want to um, create, start creating those land units, you can use some uh, processing tools to start stacking things on top of each other and uh, combine things in the way that you would like. But for now, let's stop here for a second. And I think we're going to switch back to the PowerPoint. Cool, thanks, Jed. Just a quick um, sound check. I've got a few comments that have come through from people that uh, the sound difficult to hear. It could just be my funny accent. But um, I wonder beyond that, is there are people generally able to understand? And is it me or is it Jess who's, who's harder to, uh, to hear? We should, have, we should have a vote. We can have an yeah, interactive um, a vote. Poll. Yeah, poll, yeah. Who's clear? I'm not hearing any um, anyone shouting out. And Andrew, maybe uh, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, no, I think if you just keep talking straightforward as we talked about, and then I think we can get as clear as we can for this. Okay. And and we've got the video anyway, so people can, can hopefully go back to the video and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll make sure if there's follow-up meetings that we can just fine-tune it a bit more. Understood. I'll lean, I'll lean uh, close to the, the uh, camera. We can also try and put um, captions on the recording for fun with my accent. It should be a fun, um, a fun test of real technology. So... Um, Hey, thanks for that, Jess. So I guess what we saw there was 
um, bringing data sets together into Jess's map. That's the important thing to uh, bear in mind that that was uh, Jess's map. All the data in there that she was creating was hers. Nobody else could see that unless she chose to share it with someone else. But into there, she brought those other layers of information that were coming from a variety of different sources. So a quick summary of that might be that we had national data, that imagery, that the background image, the original imagery, that's a combination of data from uh, Land Information New Zealand and the councils themselves. We bring that in and make it a seamless, uh, we call it a base map for the imagery. Um, that's pretty it's pretty good, pretty up to date for most parts of the country. It's a really good uh, popular way to see your data um, on top of. Then we had the various data sets from Canterbury Maps. We imported, uh, in that case, a shape file, which could come from a variety of third-party systems. Uh, for example, PharmIQ, it's the format they can export in. We took some data that was captured, in this case, uh, pretend the GPS data from the Wellington office um, for assets and features. And then the other thing you could have done is you could have digitized on the map using your mouse to pick up things off the aerial photography. So that's quite a common workflow is to, rather than have to go out in the field and walk paddocks, if you can see the boundary on the imagery, you can capture that as a new feature of the, of the imagery itself. So that's a nice way to capture bigger things. Unless you want to go through a lot of GPS, that's also, also an option. Going back to the freshwater farm plans, um, if you, again, if you are familiar with the how to, um, how to develop a freshwater plan, farm plan document, you'll maybe be already aware of section two. So section two is all about maps. Uh, maps are covered in a variety of other places, but section two really focuses on that. And it breaks it down into three main um, categories of data and, and how we wanted to just cover briefly how that relates to the information we saw from Jess there in terms of open data. So the first one is the features related to inherent vulnerabilities. Now, you maybe can't see it on the screen here because it's quite small, but essentially that relates to a lot of the data sets that would be coming from a regional council for the most part. There's some that might be like, like a national or a global slope there. A lot of those data sets are already available through open data sites from the, each of the unified or regional councils. And, and those that are not there, and my understanding is that a lot of them are working to make those available right now um, as the deadlines come through. So that's 2.1. The second one, um, what's well, 2.3, but it's the same sort of grouping in that it's information that would be sourced from regional councils is the catchment context information, so the CCCD stuff. And that information, whether it's the catchment boundaries themselves alone or the related um, narrative that goes with those catchments, again, that's being increasingly made available as open data sets. So that's maybe the two main sources of data that are incoming. And then we've got the data sets, which are probably the ones that you saw Jess creating there on her map, or ones you're importing from our system. So section 2.2, talks about the farming and growing activities, which could be you know, the variety of sources these may come from, but they may be ones which are ready in your current farm management systems, they may be ones which you could be capturing or getting people to capture on your behalf. And um, there's a lot of data sets in there which are that way on top of the, the underlying physiographic information. And then section 2.4 talks about the locations for physical work set out in the action plan. This is where if there's physical stuff happening on the land as part of the action plan, where are these things? What do they relate to? And um, so just to be clear that in terms of the document, the document is very open to how you should be interpreting this in the format. So we're showing a GIS tool here and nowhere in this that I'm aware of in the requirements to talk about it has to be a digital form. It can be come in a variety of different forms. So it's really quite open in that. But what we did want to do is show what sort of one approach to um, finding these data sets um, is. way to think of it is kind of as a system of how the information would flow through. So again, this is sort of our interpretation of how this might work. Those external data inputs coming from outside your own uh, your own business or your own uh, organizational client who you're working for, uh, regional councils and other national data sites. Um, and just putting in there that NEWA is also a really good data source. They have an open data portal also with national data sets. That's something to look at and, and check out also. Then there's the internal and derived data, so um, the captured data using GPS that you just showed, uh, data from third party sources such as those shape files and so on. But then the top one there, that derived data, that's really an important one. That's data sets that you're not going to, you may not be able to um, uh, download or access through a web service directly. You're going to have to create those. 
And one of those might be the land units themselves. So that combination of the slope and the soil and the physical, physical nature of the land, using the GIS tools to combine those together and create those land units, which are really the building blocks for the freshwater farm plant. So that operation of combining those two different layers, for example, that's quite a standard GIS operation, and as long as you have the data sets to support it. The other one might be looking at the create critical sourcing of data on that elevation profile. And then there's the outputs. So the action plan, if there's locations for those actions, then those can be shared out. The other part would be spatial extent for the farm uh, for the certification. Well, I wanted to look at a couple of examples briefly. Um, and bear in mind that there's, you know, there's up to 16 regional councils. Those are two we wanted to point at um, directly, um, but we'll share some information with other portals uh, a little later on. This is Canton Maps. We've seen that already. As you saw, Jess showed that um, FEP maps uh, find your zone tool. Um, but they've also got the open data site, <coughs> excuse me, which has got access to, to a whole range of different data sets, including a whole bunch to do with Christchurch, because Christchurch City Council is part of the Canton Maps Consortium. Um, but they do have some future plans to enhance this, including making some spatial data available around the intensive uh, winter grazing activities. And also they're looking into bringing more, bringing more of that historic imagery from the other um, parts of the Canterbury region. So um, I know that maybe not, even if it's not uh, youthful in terms of farm planning, I know it can be a fascinating thing to look at historical imagery for land that you know that you hear about over time. The other one is Environment Southland. So one of the, um, I guess, the earlier council of regions to be uh, introducing the freshwater um, farm plan. Um, they've got a catchment context data tool, which they're working on right now. Um, so essentially, that's uh, a reporting tool where it can give you a farm day summary, including information about the property, the cultural values, it's got the degradation map, and soils, water bodies, and so brought together in a, in a report that can be then used as the basis for, I guess, ongoing work by a consultant, by a farmer. And that's something we're looking to roll out quite soon. So check out the EAS website for more information on that. Alongside that, we do have their existing open data site, um, the data.esgs.opendata.abdames.com site, where a lot of the data that's in that report is already available to access in the way that Jess showed um, just now. So we've got, um, I think the initial plan is to roll out for one of the catchments. And then they're going to roll out those other catchments um, down the track a little bit. I mentioned that's two um, councils we just wanted to mention briefly. We have seen as we're map people, we love maps. We, there's a tool we use in ours, which is a, a map of all regional council boundaries. And to each of the boundaries, we attach information. We use this for our own projects and So we thought we'd share it with um, this audience also today. Um, where we've got just a link to the open data portals for each of the regions. Not all of them you know, are ones that we are aware of. There's a couple that we're not quite sure what they are. So if, um, if there's folks in the pink areas who want to let us know, then we'd happily add it to um, to the map. But we've got a, a bunch of links at the end, but this one we thought would be useful. With a QR code, you can go ahead and scan there. It should take you to a link to that map, um, which in turn relates to the individual open data sites. Feeling that you can always be over this in it. This is fine. Okay, so we're going to come on to the, the last demonstration we wanted to show you today, which was about other aspects of these GIS tools and maybe some more advanced ones um, that we hope will get you interested in terms of what we could do with this open data plus GIS combo. Yep. Okay, this is the uh, final stop along the journey of that map. I was creating and showing you guys. Uh, so going back, so I've been just staying in my RGS online portal, essentially, uh, while I was showing you guys the things I'm adding, uh, all the data layers that I want. Um, but what happens when I want to be done with this map? What can I create afterwards when all the data is already there? And um, one of the things uh, that you are able to create is something called a dashboard. And so what a dashboard is, uh, is just basically a summary and statistical tool, uh, an overview of whatever information that you want summarized, uh, with the idea of it being as interactive as you would like. 
So with this, I have the same map integrated in the center, but I have the ability to have some reporting on the uh, on sides here that I can configure. I can add some pie charts of information. Um, I can add some indicators here that will sum up certain, certain uh, statistics that I want. So if I move around the map, this is also interactive. So if I zoom in here, it'll tell me what I'm seeing. I'm actually only looking at 290 hectares. But if I move around here, maybe 218. Uh, and if I, let's say I click on one of these blocks, you have some pop-ups available. Uh, and so this basically is uh, a way to uh, report or to provide information to others if you want to share your data in whatever way you see fit uh, and with your own control over who's able to see this. Um, this is just basically a more interactive way to create a report. Um, you obviously can still create a PDF of just a printable map with whatever information you want. Um, but like this, we can have a list here that updates with the most recent um, assets or inspections that have occurred on the farm. Uh, we can see them listed by dates and have some information of who created them. Um, that's just one thing that you can do with this map. Uh, we just want to just mention that also have 3D capabilities now. So uh, when you have a map uh, in our system line, you're able to just kind of create a, a very simple uh, 3D scene. And with this, again, we just have uh, our satellite imagery based map here on the bottom just showing a pretty high resolution actually of the farm. And then we can, same as we did in the previous maps, we can add information to this. And so we can just create our own data again, create some fence lines so we get kind of a realistic and really informative view of our farm. And I'm going to stop it there for I'm not going to go too in depth about 3D uh, because there's a lot we can talk about with GIS and the potential with farms. So actually returning once again, uh, that was my last switcheroo to the map. Uh, just to talk about the things that we're not talking about today, that uh, for those of you who may have a little bit of GIS experience and might want to go beyond this, um, there's definitely lots more that you can do. There is slope analysis that you can do using like that slope layer or uh, other elevation LIDAR information. Uh, we have deep learning packages now that you can download and you can do things like uh, detect trees in satellite imagery. Um, we also have the capability of really analyzing that imagery. Um, there's a really cool site uh, down below the screenshot of so Sentinel-2 uh, satellite imagery that has some um, analysis layers that you can play with. Uh, below is uh, for those who might be familiar with NDVI, um, just to get an idea of the health of your crops. Um, beyond that, there's uh, some kind of advanced hydrology tools for those who uh, might have used ArcMap or have moved on to ArcGIS Pro. Uh, ArcGIS Pro has some really cool uh, hydrology tool sets that will allow you to create your own streams using elevation data, using digital elevation models. Um, and from there, you can actually create your own catchments, create your own watersheds that are much more smaller scale to just your farm. And um, it's a really good way to create those critical source areas uh, if you need to, to get them really accurate for just the local scale of your farm. Cool. Thank you. So um, hopefully that gives you a bit of a sense of open data as a topic as a whole, geospatial open data levels as well as um, how it can be applied within a geographic context using some of those online tools. We didn't show any of the desktop values, tools, tools that we just, just spoke about, but um, they're also um, also available. Um, but really, I guess the main purpose was to um, just share, raise awareness about the tools and how they could be used in a variety of ways, including um, fresh water farm farms. We thought we'd finish off with a, with a, uh, a slide covered in links that you can't click on. Uh, that was my idea. Um, so if you're pressing your screen with your finger right now, it's not going to work. Um, but what we will do is we'll ensure that all of these um, links are shared with you um, after the fact. Um, there's a bunch there on the right to do with Canterbury specific resources. So if you're in Canterbury or you're visiting Canterbury and want to check out more, there's some good stuff in there, including one which talks about um, connecting to the Canterbury map services. That's the web services, technical web services. From your own geospatial software, which is a really nice one to guide you through some of the steps that guests um, showed us there just now. 
Um, and then on the left hand side, we've got um, the Open Data Link for Environment Southland, also um, that MFD document we spoke about, and a couple of other portals which you may be aware of that don't use our technology, but I've got some really good data sets on there. One of them is Matthew Penelow's um, LRS um, site, and also the coordinates New Zealand data site. So um, we've just got a global set of data, but um, you can filter it just in New Zealand data sets. And, and there's some really um, valuable data sets there also. Uh, so we'll share these links um, in a more useful form rather than just on the screen just now. The other resources we're going to share where we're learning. So if this GIS thing is new to you, or you want to take uh, the next steps, then we found some online um, free open online courses that you could use, um, including getting started with this RGS online tool, the one that Jason can show you in the browser, which is a really simple and straightforward way to get to start uh, with the, the mapping. Um, so this online tutorials. The other two things to, um, I guess, raise are we've got a New Zealand Esri user conference, which is about the GIS technology in all sectors, including the agricultural space. We're holding in Auckland on the 25th to the 27th of September in, uh, in Auckland this year. And there's also, of course, the NZRM conference itself in Christchurch, the potential for further discussion. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass back to Adrian. Cool, thank you guys. That's a, a very in-depth um, and I was frantically writing notes because there's going to be things I'm going to be doing differently <laughs> from tomorrow um, with the way I use GIS. So um, you, you've got one fan already, so that's all good. Um, there's a, a couple of questions in here um, and so I'll, I'll just uh, read out both of them are relating to, um, to LiDAR. So um, first one is how confident can we be with the LiDAR data, for example, um, if we're wanting to use that and the accuracy of it um, at paddock level for determining what's over 10 degrees for freshwater farm plans. So the mm -hmm. rules are saying one thing and then do we, do we have the technology to actually help us to do that? Yeah, cool. I'm going to ask Bonavain to speak to that, who's, uh, who's our Mr. Data and Slope. Hi. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. Yeah, so basically Lynn set out a specification for capturing the LiDAR. So that specification should uh, tell you the confidence level of which you can use it. Um, whether a regional council will accept your analysis, uh, I'm not too sure. I think best to get in touch with the regional council on how the, uh, the slope is calculated. Um, but if you wanna know about the um, actual uh, specification of the LiDAR that is being captured, you can find it on the uh, data set. I'll, I'll just add to that, Barabain, that um, remember the LiDAR capture uh, lens are helping coordinate, but it's actually through the regional councils themselves, so it's their data sets. So um, again, can't um, answer on behalf of a council, but I think you could safely assume, um, you know, the, the, the one metre DTMs, the Specifications for the point cloud capture are, you know, vertical accuracies less than less than or equal to 20 centimeters and horizontal less than or equal to 100, 100 centimeters. But yeah, you can you can get access to the specifications. And probably just following on from that is um, in terms of the coverage for some of the some of these data layers across the country. I know, you know we've obviously we get access, access, has, ah, access to it through councils, but is there good coverage for some of these layers, like the LIDAR lay, layers, et cetera, for when, you know, you know, as users, we're probably going to be doing freshwater farm plants and wanting access to those. So if it's not available, one, is it, is, is, is it there in the first place? And two, is there the availability, even if it's not through council? Yeah, Bredevin, did you want to speak to that again? Uh, yeah, so first on the availability, there is a website and it was posted in the question and answers um, link as well by Sarah. Um, so there is a list from Linz of what is available now and what is expected to come out. Um, it's probably all going to be coming out in next, uh, uh, the, the rest of the year and next year. Um, so you can see what is available there. It also brings you to the actual data set where you can get more information. So what LINS does is the regional council captures it and LINS publishes it on their uh, LINS data service. 
And what they do as well is the LiDAR is being captured, but they create DEMs and DSMs of it that you can download from their portal. Also, all this data is uh, flowing into the, um, uh, some of the layers in ArcGIS. So uh, just briefly showed a, a terrain layer that can um, show you the slope of an area. And that is all using the um, uh, elevation data that is being captured um, by regional council. So as it comes available, it will flow into those layers as well. Uh, in the same way that it's being added to the 3D layer. So at the end, you saw a map of a um, 3D uh, uh, of a farm in 3D. And the relief of the terrain is actually coming from all that elevation data as well. And then where there's no um, high resolution LiDAR uh, data available for the elevation, uh, we're, we're using the 8 meter DEM from LINS that has national, uh, national coverage, but isn't as accurate um, as the LiDAR data. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question I think is, is good to go over. It's been answered in the um, in the question and answer, but um, no, you, you highlighted the use of uh, um, using the phone to collect data on site. And a question was asked about what apps are available. And mm -hmm. I suppose the other question is, are, are they freely available? Because uh, no, a lot of people could be independent consultants and I've used collector apps before doing work for councils, but never use one for my own work. So. How does how does that all work for everybody who's who's potentially go, going to be going it you know into freshwater farm plans? Do you want to talk about the apps themselves? Yeah, and then maybe Sarah could talk about the the licensing part. Yeah, yes. Uh, so currently we have uh, three three major apps that we like to kind of talk of as our field operation apps. The one that I was showing uh, was Field Maps. Um, and so that is our map centric, uh, and that is the ability to uh, kind of keep an eye on your map um, and have, see all your assets at once on your phone or your mobile device, um, and then update information or draw new features. Um, and the idea of all of these apps is that there's similar functionality. It's more of the user experience that you uh, prefer. There is also Survey123. Um, and now while this one can have maps, um, it's a mobile app that's, or uh, a web also, it can just be um, a website or a web browser if you want, um, not necessarily a mobile app, uh, but that's a form-based one. And so that's where you can really customize the questions that you want people to see and fill out. Um, and the third and final, the third one is uh, Quick Capture, uh, which is kind of your simple button interface uh, in which you want very simple choices. Uh, and it's meant for uh, as, as wide ranging a audience as possible and that no one with GIS experience needs to use it. Uh, and that you can click buttons, take pictures, um, annotate the, the photos um, or just drop information that's already been pre-configured like a button that says, uh, yes, this fence is fixed. You push it and it immediately instantaneously sends data. Um, to your sort of cloud connected uh, account. So those are the, the three apps and they all have varying, um, I'm gonna pass over to you, Sarah, to talk about the licensing of those and how it works with public versus um, your organizational account there. In terms of licensing, so yeah, um, perhaps if anyone's interested in, in using the apps, depending on how they're using it, they're probably best to drop us a line and um, we can go over that individually. But there are some, uh, you can get ArcGIS uh, a free account um, and you can also get a, uh, like a private use, like if you're studying um, and then there are commercial licenses, depending on your use case. Um, there are some costs for some of the licensing, obviously, if you're using it for, for commercial activities. So best to get in touch and, and I can um, direct you there. Cool. No, that's really good. I think as we get more into the fresh warm farm, farm plans and you know, the, the kind of using digital more, there'll be more things coming up. So, um, so yeah, so um, thank you um, for the team for presenting that to us. There was a lot of information to take in, but uh, we will make the presentation um, available so we can all use the links that are there. Um, we'll also make the video recording available and really keen on feedback um, from listeners or other people as about what are the things we can be doing in this space to help to provide support and opportunity 
for NZAR members, um, consultants, etc., in terms of you know, upskilling. And so we're all using these um, resources with, with confidence. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, we'll look forward to you. We'll, we'll soon, um, soon be um, putting out dates for our, our next webinar, um, but I will just close with a karakia. Key tau, key kato, um, to, sorry, um, key tau, key, Tato Kartoa, Tiao Tiara Mi Ti Matua, Tihi Mariori. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a safe rest of the day. Hope you are a lot drier than what we are in the Waikato, and uh, yeah, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys.